Hello and welcome to episode four of the S Cafe House, where I, Johnny Sells, Artistic Director of Solomon's Knot, am chatting to Professor Stephen Rose, Dr. Bettina Farvik, and SK Alto, Dr. Nathan Mercheka about our upcoming project of Bach Motets. Not only the Bach Motets, which you might know already, uh, we're performing all seven of the probably uh, by J.S. Bach well-known motets and also four motets by Johann Christoph Bach, the cousin of J.S. Bach's father who was born in Arnstadt and organist in Eisenach and so was probably the person whose organ playing the young Johann Sebastian first heard. We're performing the program in London and at the Albrecht Festival and the Musikfest Stuttgart in summer 2022 and then later on in the year at the London International Festival of Early Music and in Bruges. We're also going to record all of these pieces for CD this summer. So look out for that release early next year. Great, so welcome to this episode of the S Café House, which is all about... Bach motets, but not just the motets by J.S. Bach, as we will discover. I'm delighted to welcome and very grateful to Bettina Farvik and Stephen Rose and Nathan Mercheka for joining us today. Uh, thanks so much for sparing some of your extremely valuable time. Uh, Stephen Rose is Professor of Music and Director of Research at Royal Holloway, University of London, and he's edited motets and cantatas by Bach's predecessors and is currently developing a project unlocking the old manuscripts of music held in England's county archives, which is something that I very much want to find out more about, if not today. Um, Bettina Farvich is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Music at the University of Cambridge and Fellow of Emmanuel College. And her new book, new book alert, uh, Music in the Flesh, an Early Modern Musical Physiology is coming out with Chicago next spring. And if you can't wait that long, her edited volume, Rethinking Bach, is just out uh, with Oxford, Oxford University Press. Um, Bettina, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the focus of that book is? Yes, I'd love to. Well, it's got uh, a chapter by Stephen in it to start with, which is always good news. Um, <laughs> the idea of the volume uh, was to look at where Bar scholarship has got to in the early 21st century and um, see where we can shake things up or push things along or um, open up interesting future directions for thinking about um, this massive figure in um, the Western musical tradition. Uh, so uh, we've got some established Bach scholars who are uh, thinking through um, issues that they've worked on for a very long time. Uh, so Stephen is thinking about uh, Bach and material culture. Um, there's a chapter by myself about Bach at the keyboard, what happened when he was sitting down to invent music at the keyboard. Uh, I also have various people in there from outside Bach scholarship because I wanted some views uh, from uh, beyond and from abroad onto this uh, sometimes very uh, self-contained island of Bach scholarship in order to try and open things up. So it's it's a wide range of ways of thinking about hearing, listening to um, Bach in different ways. Excellent. I'm hoping that you'll provide a sort of bridge between we performers, Nathan and I, and and the world of scholarship in that in that sense, since we are the flesh in this particular case. Um, and I should. Uh, last but not least, introduce Nathan, who is an alto with Solomon's Knot and is joining this Motets project for the first time. The rest of us have um, previously memorized the Motets of J.S. Bach, and for those of us, it's perhaps slightly less of a daunting thing, but Nathan is right in the middle of that memorization marathon. Um, so his time perhaps the most precious of this week I don't know since we're starting next week um, but he also happens to have a PhD in musicology from Royal Holloway as well and uh, um, 
and his PhD examines the ethical impli implications of writing about music and analyzing music. So um, I'm hoping you're going to bring that in at some point, Nathan. Uh, I certainly could do. Yeah, I should say that um, Stephen was was one of my was one of my lecturers when I was doing my masters at Royal Holloway, and actually the projects I'm working on at the moment to do with uh, to do with uh, the interaction of technology and performance, uh, which this is a kind of a prime example. It actually, comes out of uh, a course that I took under his under his tutelage uh, during my masters year. So yeah, but I'll certainly be happy to talk about both angles. So it's very much all in the family uh, today, which is apt because our program of motets includes four pieces by Johann Christoph Bach, who was not Bach's uncle, as is often uh, cited, but in fact the cousin of his father. Um, and probably the, the one of his many, many composing forebears, um, up to whom he the most looked, as one might say in Germany. Um, We've chosen four pieces, three of which uh, there's evidence that, that J.S. Bach, I'm going to have to keep distinguishing between which Bach, uh, J.S. Bach performed in the last decade or so of his life in Leipzig. Um, there's material which he prepared for performances. Um, those are Lieber Herr Gott, Wecke uns auf. <laughs> Another eight part uh, double choir motet, um, Herr nun lesses du deinen Diener, the Nunc Dimittis in German, and um, Der Gerechte, ob er gleich zu zeitlich stirbt, which is a five part piece, and which has one other five part piece, um, which is called Fürchte dich nicht, which obviously ties in with one of Bach's bigger motets as well. Um, Stephen, I was wondering whether you could kick us off with a little bit more around the context of what what Bach was doing, digging out these old motets um, right at the end, end of his life and probably quite a while after he'd written his own offerings in that genre. This is really interesting because generally the attitude in the early 18th century in Bach's time, J.S. Bach's time, was that old music was fairly worthless and should just be used as kindling for the fire or uh, you know thrown out and replaced by the latest cantata but uh, J.S. Bach was deeply interested in the music of his predecessors in his family I should say his family uh, ancestors um, so he made this very elaborate family tree which is actually uh, like an a uh, picture of a tree, and on the branches there are these little fruit, each uh, resemble each with the, the details of a family member. And he was very keen to collect uh, examples of the sacred music by his ancestors. And he had to sort of beg and borrow um, manuscripts that had been you know, previously used in churches elsewhere or maybe by family members. And it built up this collection of material which was then called the Altbarkisches Archiv, the Old Bark Archive, uh, which then J.S. Bark added to in that he was uh, not simply just collecting this material, he was using it some of this as performance for performances. So he actually was adding uh, performance parts to some of these motets written about 70 or 75 years earlier. So it's a complete contrast to the idea that old music is pointless and not worth performing. And, and as you said, Johnny, uh, Lieber Herr Gott, um, probably Bach was, was making these parts uh, to perform it, these extra instrumental parts, um, as one of the, the last acts of his life. So it seems as he reached old age, he was really thinking about posterity and his place in history and his family's place in history and kind of closing the circle by kind of looking for his origins and coming back to this old family music and performing it um, as he was contemplating death and moving to a new um, you know, life in heaven himself. <laughs> 
he he'd stopped writing cantatas certainly cantata cycles quite a long while before this and there isn't really any evidence that he was writing any motets for posterity or um but vocal music uh in that sense is it right that he was potentially engraving some of the b minor mass for posterity around this time or is there is there much sense that he was thinking of his own vocal music in that context or was it mainly just um the forebears so yes in the 1740s he was putting together uh, the b minor mass from uh, previous things so the kyrie and the gloria had been written in the early 1730s so there were uh, little bits of vocal music that he was assembling but in at this time of, in his life you're right he had lost interest in the day-to-day -day chores of church music and writing cantatas for every sunday and most of the compositions the new compositions are the more experimental instrumental works like the art of fugue and uh, the musical offering which are doing very kind of specialized contrapuntal things um so yeah he does seem to have kind of moved to a, a distance away from his own vocal music at this point maybe he's kind of have a sense of historical distance that then gets him looking at these things from the 1670s Bettina do you have any take on that with your with your thoughts on you know the physicalization of music this is music for history rather than music for the listeners because certainly in the case of you know if we look at J.S. Bach's him, motets himself they were mostly as far as we know written for very much for one-off occasions and intended you know intended to be used for a specific function which will be quite different from what we how we see them today yeah, I think it's probably true that um, by the 1740s, as Stephen said, Bach was uh, engaged in a sort of process of gathering things and, and uh, surveying what he had achieved and what to do with all the bits and pieces uh, that were lying around his desk and his musical library and so on. Um, if, you, if we want to think about the physical sort of corporeal dimension in all of that, I would say that uh, I think what we need to imagine is that a lot of this music was going around Bach's head all the time. Um, and it was in his fingers, it was in his, uh, you could say mind, but uh, certainly in an early modern context, you would think of that as embodied in some way. So he himself, suffused with music, um, comes back to these tunes that pop back into his head and that he then wants to do something else with because he liked them. And so he writes them into a movement of the B minor mass, so many of which are parody movements. So I think if we, if we want to think about Bach as a flesh and blood being, even in the 1740s when he was writing all this abstract counterpoint, we can... In, in one way, we can think about him as someone who is suffused with music. I know that what we do when we memorize all of this stuff is utterly ahistorical, but there is a parallel there with what you're saying, um, in that it's very much in our minds. Uh, <laughs> we wouldn't pretend to get anywhere close to, to Bach, but I suppose in a sense um, it is unusual. It's something quite special to, to have um, fully assimilated that sort of, uh, complete polyphonic web into one's brain in a way which normally as a performer one never would. And um, I, I think what's interesting is that uh, today we of course think of memory as something that is in the brain, right? So if we think about committing something to memory, um, we think of that happening up in our heads, but certainly for um, 17th, 18th century musicians, uh, that very much was a process that also involved the heart and the muscles of the fingers. Um, and uh, memory was something that suffused, again, the bodily fibers in a way that, in a more sort of craniocentric model of what a human being is, becomes harder to imagine. But um, I think as musicians, we do have that sense that the shape and progress of a piece of music we don't just have that up in the head in terms of sort of cognitive note by note uh, memorization it's something that we know with our musical beings more holistically
Yeah, I was wondering if I could jump in. Yeah, it's, it's obviously being, as Johnny says, in the midst of this um, at the moment. Uh, one of the things, so the first thing they teach you at memorization school is uh, not to uh, not to just sing it over and over again and rely on muscle memory in that sense. And you, so you do some real intellectual work so that at the, so my aim is always that I could write it out if I wanted to by hand. Um, but what's been really interesting is actually having gone through that stage a lot, so spending a lot of time with the score and spending a lot of time kind of listening to um, Solomon's Not's previous recordings and kind of karaoke in my head, what's been the game changer for me is actually doing the singing, is actually having con physical contact with the notes. Um, and must, and so what's, what I found in the last uh, few weeks uh, or month or so is that kind of re-engaging that muscular level has been really, really vital. <laughs> Um, because actually, particularly in music as contrapuntally complex as the J.S. Bach, um, the brain isn't enough to, to get you through those long passages of coloratura or those, um, or those I'm thinking of something like Comier's You Come, where the final section uh, has this, this tripartite uh, division where all three are quite similar but not not completely identical. The only thing that's going to get you through that at the end of the day is some sort of embodied memory uh, of how it's supposed to go. Um, and actually, the distinct, what's really interesting for me I, I, um, is that that's, that's quite dissimilar from my experience of the JC Bach. The JC Bach seems to lie down a bit easier um, and is something that, I, that kind of does exist for me more easily on an intellectual plane. Obviously, the singing is is important for other reasons as well to have that kind of physical practice but um but the big difference between the js and the jc bark for me are the extent to which the the body is necess a necessary part of the performance and actually it's something you see through the chronology of the js bark is that ich lasse das nicht ich lasse dich nicht probably the earliest one uh is is obviously much more similar to the jc bark examples and so has a similar feel it has a similar vibe to it when I sing it than something like Zing It, which you know, once you get to the Dick and Zion, you kind of just have to go and, and trust that your body will take you the rest of the way. Ich lasse dich nicht, du nicht ich lasse dich nicht, du nicht This point, Nathan, about how um, you know the development of Bach's style and the, the sheer demands of some of the, uh, the, the, the large motets in terms of the vocal demands. In although motets were meant to be music without independent instrumental parts, so it was meant to be music primarily for the voice. It, he is really pushing the singers to do lines that are as instrumental as some of the writing in his cantatas. So I don't know if that kind of feeds into your physical experience in terms of, you know, breathing and just the, the, the stamina required for some of those lines. Yeah, I mean, from a technical perspective, again, the, the famous thing about Bach is that there's no, everyone, you know, everyone says when they're learning Bach for the first time, there's nowhere to breathe. Uh, and so some of the, it's good that we're doing some of the four part stuff with eight singers, because we can cover a lot of those complex lines um, without without uh, ruining the counterpoint. Um, but from the, it's, when you're talking about the technical demands, again, going back to that mind body split, I'm thinking of certain bits of zing it. Uh, where I s wasted a lot of time trying to memorize. So there's, <laughs> what's really interesting about Bach, I think, is how few wasted notes there are, how quite a lot of the time, even though it's obviously harmonically 
functional. Uh, it's not harmonically conceived, it's contrapuntally conceived. However, there are moments where he's in what I would call a holding pattern, where the, we're vaguely around a perfect cadence in G minor and someone else has got the tune and so the altos need to do something to take them from A to B uh, and it's in semiquavers so there's constant semiquaver movement and I spent a lot of time trying to remember okay so it start it's a lower turn and then an upper turn and then a and then a what a echauffe and a da 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 does it go da 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 first or da 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 for all of that did that for a long time didn't get anywhere started actually singing it and thinking less and then realizing that actually it's a very that you can without without thinking too much you can sing it because it turns out that even those holding patterns are very singable they're very uh they're, they're very natural contrapuntal lines um and so it's nice to kind of almost have that three-way division where sometimes <clears throat> sometimes you're doing something that makes complete sense because it's a tune because every part is a tune just like you know i tell my 12 year old piano students when i define counterpoint you know or polyphony everyone's got the tune at the same time um very occasionally it's something that's clearly harmonically conceived, like a flat of nicht or something like that. Um, but then there's this other kind of third way where even though it might not be real counterpoint um, and you are doing something that is basically fulfilling a harmonic function, again on that muscular level what Bach has managed to do is write a line, a line that makes sense and a line that you can sing without too much brain power. Um, and I think that's really, really interesting. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's that's wonderful the the way you talk about it. It really uh, gets us away from this image of Bach as the sort of abstract in the brain intellectual exercise that, especially towards the end of his life, um, that that's the narrative, right? That that's what happens to him, and um, it's it's in the it's in the singing in the, in the act of invoicing this that the music, as you said, begins to make sense, right? Um, and I think that's something that's so important also when we think about uh, uh, listeners, the listeners um, who encounter this music, um, where, you know, so much musicological commentary you read about Bach is, is very concerned with sense making on a sort of, um, uh, on a hermeneutic level. Uh, on the level of trying to figure out what the what the theological message is, what is the doctrine, and what what uh, kind of uh, theological insight is a listener meant to take away from this music? But then, of course, as you say, there are so many notes, right? <laughs> and so, why are there all these notes? If if it's about the message, uh, you can then you know look at the J C Bach motets. You can say, well, this is transparent. You can you can hear the words. You can sort of this makes sense as a musical elaboration of a biblical dictum, say, right? But with with the Bach motets, it's just excess. There's this sonic overflow that makes you think, why, why is all this here? So I think you mentioned Sing it in hand, right? That opening. You, as a listener, you might know that the first word is zing it. But it's actually quite hard even to hear the first word because there's just this constant z z z right, um, and the 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 second syllable the zingert goes down the octave, so it's 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 actually hard to hear, and it just creates this buzz right, and you're sort of immersed in it, and that's again uh, a kind of experience that is only partially uh, intellectually grasped, and it's something that actually is. An embodied experience. It's a sensual experience, and it's something that you uh, you live through, and it has an impact on you in a corporeal way, as well as maybe giving you a sense of uh, what you've been to learn from it um, theologically. Well, that that has to be one of the most wonderful openings to any piece of music. I mean, apart from the fact that it's just music about music and singing about singing and just suffused with this uh, joyful wordlessness as you imply Bettina it's it's mostly just on e um, and 
goes on and on and on uh, just enjoying itself in a, in an inexpressible way and in, in an un, yeah not not uh, directly linked to any kind of textual idea there's so many interesting things um in what you said nathan there about uh, about the memorization process which sort of gives us a privileged angle uh, on the music in a way um <clears throat> i always find uh, with Bach, not only the vocal music, I suppose, but uh, specifically here in in the motets, which it really could be considered as this kind of apotheosis of polyphony, uh, just outrageous eight part counterparts, um, pa counterpoint uh, some of the time. But it's never, as so often with Bach, it's never just that. How could you write such astonishingly complicated music, which still touches you more deeply than so much other music that's what i can never quite grasp with Bach or what i what i suppose what we all find so endlessly fascinating it's uh, a mathematician could spend their life uh, studying it and be utterly unmoved by it but totally fascinated or per perhaps you know amazed by the beauty of it on paper but then as soon as it becomes sounding uh, material um one couldn't care less if it was amazingly clever because it's it, it touches you on an emotional level that that cuts through all of that um and actually that the that sort of crystalline perfection angle of it is what i find makes it stick in the brain i think this is what you're hinting at nathan that you know trying to learn what the patterns are didn't work because actually there's something about the full common height of it that that burns itself somehow into into one's brain especially i think especially if you do understand a little bit of of the underlying musical patterns and i find i mean you know we've we've memorized all sorts of different things over the years um and the, well, i suppose the jc bach is a direct comparison in this program interesting that you say nathan that you found some of that is often simpler to make it stick but i often find with lesser composers not meaning to be mean to them but um there's a, a sort of looser structure um often which makes it much harder to for me to remember it um you know the fugues will be less strictly put together i mean handles an obvious comparison um having memorized all of messiah um <laughs> it's sort of sort of on a level with this even though the music on the surface is is much simpler um and we talk often within the group when we're talking about memorizing um and especially coming back to projects that we've memorized before about um metadata so essentially there's the there's the sort of deep level um memorized material which kind of never goes away um i mean we first we first did sing it and a lot of us first memorized it seven years ago um and i came back to it a couple of days ago and found that within a few hours nine or within about an hour 90 percent of it was you know still there but there are these things that one needs right at the front of one's memory so i suppose in the short term um which are, I guess, the slightly less logical bits or slightly strange text uh, distribution that won't stay. And that's the kind of metadata that one needs to sort of go back and plug back in. So I suppose in a way that's the mental side of it. And the rest of it is, yeah, is plugged into something much more profound somehow. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, I, I too know the joy and pain of memorizing the Messiah. Um, there's a there's been a few stage messiahs over the years, and I think about about eighty percent of the uh, of the singers in the southeast have at some point done a stage messiah that's required them to learn it. So we have this chat a lot. Um, yeah, and you get you get a page and a half into a Handel fugue, and it's all fine, and then you're kind of at sea for about four pages because it's fairly loosely structured and you just need to learn it and then you get the you know you get the final statements um and then it seems to and it will kind of make sense again um and yeah you're right this is very unlike that and i think so this is where i'm in hot water with myself because so my 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 earlier research when i was doing my doctorate was very much on this was taking a fairly I guess a conservative position on analysis, but trying to make it radical. And so the sorts of things I'm about to say, I would be 
I would have been very in favour of back then in 2015, uh, 16, 17. Uh, I'm now moving away from that, but I wonder... You know, if there's Are you historicizing yourself, Nathan? Yes, exactly. That's 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 how historically informed I am at this wow. point. Wow. Um, uh, but I, you know, what you could say is that the the kind of the dream of analysis is to kind of justify every note and every gesture and kind of the dream structure. At least, you know, certainly from like a Shankarian perspective or anything, would be to have these kind of a Russian doll set of ideas where where this where there's very few seams between anything there's very little randomness and that you have you have zinger dame Hearn, and then within in that you have a tripartite structure which makes real sense because it's fast slow fast and then within each of those movements you have statements which latrin are naturally developed because of their own internal motivation um and so what you what you get in a structure like that is that you would expect that to be very easy to memorize because you start and then you go and everything just once once you know how it goes it all makes sense um uh and certainly that's been my experience of a lot of these the things that i have to work hard to remember things like in the middle movement of uh zinger um got nimbus ferner uh which you know we've got five got nimbus ferners in a row which one comes next that sort of thing i need to go okay so it's the one that i start first and then it's that you know so that kind of metadata but then within each of those it's very you know, logical. Um, the reason I now have difficulties thinking like, and so I, bas I basically agree with you. I basically agree that, 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 you know, there's a reason why historical, why analysis, the history of analysis evolved the way it did. And there's a reason why a certain type of analyst really worships Bach. And it's because that ideology, that goal works really, really well for kind of the high point of Bach's output and the motets I think are a prime example of that where yeah basically the reason it's easy to come back to it after five years um, is because once you've got that Russian doll structure in your head the notes sort of fill themselves in because those are the only notes you could use in that circumstance. Um, the reason I'm looking over my shoulder is that's obviously like a really highly problematic way of thinking about music these days um, and it's being critiqued for a uh, about 30 years now um, this is the, the creationist way of looking at music as far as i can work out yeah it's kind of a very naturalist way but but what's really interesting i think about the discussion we're having here is that plugging in this embodied viewpoint might be a really crucial corrective to this because some of the things that we've been talking about so you know so far about how some of these lines make sense which if you were gonna again if you were gonna historicize that you would say well we're talking about fingerprints musical gestures, musical topics that people will have picked up by being enculturated in the choral scene and the broader language of the high baroque. But, but effectively that kind of more material level of knowledge um, might be a really useful way of, I don't know, adding some nuance to the otherwise fairly positivist, fairly conservative way of thinking about Bach's structure and saying, whilst it is very well structured and clearly structured and we should admire him for that nevertheless there is this um essential unremovable part of kind of, of material culture um and embodied knowledge that uh yeah so one way of thinking about it i suppose to finish would be saying that actually it's those seams it's those little joins those little bits that you find difficult that in some ways are the most valuable because those are the those are the moments where bach as it were, had a choice. Those are the moments where that's him. You can feel him moving his pen on the paper and saying, I'm going to do this now. Instead, I'm going to do this unexpected thing. Um, the imperfections in the diamond. What can I say? <laughs> I, I'm sorry to jump in here, but you know, you just, you just, uh, I, 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 I just couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, th this, this whole, this whole book that I've wrote, which is now finally off my desk. Hallelujah. Um, it, it started from this fundamental sense of dissatisfaction with the way in which musicological talk about Bach somehow didn't seem to get to what, what was so cool about it, what, what really got you about it. As is often the case with a lot of musicology. Ah, well, that's just rude. <laughs> um, 
you, you might have a point, but you know, let's try and do something about it. So there are structural ways of talking about Bach. Uh, you know, you can, you know, you can be the mathematician and you can work out where all the fugue entries are and, and so on and so on. And that's fascinating. There's, there's hermeneutic ways of talking about Bach where you try and work out how particular musical gestures uh, basically do the elaborate word painting that gets the meaning of the words across, right? Um, but the thing that gets me and the thing that I'm trying to find ways to talk about um, in sort of historicized ways, so thinking about historical bodies and historical listeners and historical performers, but it's, it's the way in which in the moment of performance, in the moment of invoicing those blots on the page, that's when things happen. And, and that doesn't mean that you only talk about, well, you know, um, it, it doesn't, it, doesn't reduce the richness of the analysis you might come up with. So you can think about breath um, in really interesting ways, how it relates to phrases, how it relates to affect. Um, I don't know if we, what, what should, okay, let's, let's give JC a, a bit of space, right? Um, I don't know, if you take, fürchte dich nicht, yeah. Um, so the, the, the textual message obviously is, uh, do not fear, do not be afraid. Right. Um, what he does in the opening there is really interesting because, well, first of all, the alto actually first of all sings "Fürchte dich" before they think, sing "Fürchte dich nicht." Right. Um, and the way in which that sort of opening statement is just interspersed with these rests, there's a sense in which the notation inspires this sort of almost, it invites a, a mode of sort of hyperventilation or tremulent hesitation, or you don't, I mean, you could breathe in each of those gaps and you might not, but it, it, there, there's some, some way in which um, the singer's action in producing the sound is directly linked to the affective output um, and the way in which that kind of music might make a listener feel tremulous and uh, sort of hesitant and afraid or, or you know what, whatever it is it depends on the particular performance how you invoice it and so how you how you make it work <laughs> Or those aspects of, you know, the, the, the thing that, to my mind, makes Bach so incredibly rich and, and inexhaustible is the way in which he layers so many things on top of other things all the time, right? Uh, so you have the chorales and then they go along with uh, all sorts of other things, different combinations. And um, I mean, it's the cool thing about music that you can do that, right? You can have these distinct strands and they sort of run alongside. But again, you could analyze that on the page and say, well, this is how he does it and this is how the counterpoint works. Or you could actually think about what is the lived experience of being immersed in this kind of uh, multiple uh, differentiated sound world, how could a listener even start to make sense of that? And that again takes you away from structure and semantic content and it takes you towards something that is much more uh, sensory embodied um, and sense making on a different kind of level. particularly because with the motets, the components are phrases from the Bible and phrases from the German hymn tunes, the chorales, and the, both of those would be incredibly well known to devout Lutherans, so they would be part of the kind of mental soundtrack of people's homes and their devotion. So all the voices and the words you're hearing in these motets, they would be kind of pulling up these kind of emotional and devotional associations in the list 
listeners. And it would be probably quite an overwhelming experience because you would have meditated on these words and you might have heard your parents or members of your family saying, using these biblical sayings or, or um, you know, singing that chorale tune. And now it's all brought together in a different combination. So it's doing something with a familiar that then will touch on the senses and the memory. Uh, I'm uh, glad you said that, Stephen. Staying with Fürchte dich nicht uh, by Jay Seabach, um, which you brought up, Bettina, which is a fantastic piece in itself. Um, on that very point, Stephen, uh, he does this Messiah-like uh, com text combination um, to to make the connection again with Messiah that we've got Old Testament and New Testament um, fused together. So uh, like in that restative in Messiah when uh, when uh, the words are, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And that's actually a, an instantaneous leap from the Old Testament into the New Testament and showing <clears throat> this whole idea of, of prophecy fulfilled. Um, that within this Fürchte dich nicht text, suddenly halfway through you get, um, sorry, the Fürchte dich nicht text, which is from um, Isaiah, suddenly you get um, wahrlich, wahrlich, ich sage dir, I'm going to be with you in paradise, um, which is a, a sudden leap into Luke's gospel. And I'm sure that wouldn't have been lost either, that that sort of um, theological leap, which would have, well, for those who were really uh, listening carefully, would have uh, been quite a surprise and of course there's this fantastic coup de théâtre in that piece with the the surprising entry of the of the soprano chorale which waits a full 38 bars before before coming in <laughs> I wonder, Stephen, if you could maybe go a bit further into looking at how or to what extent J.X. Bach's motet style might have been influenced in some way from those predecessors, because you've got this this Arnstadt motet sort of model with the with the soprano chorale theme. There's an obvious parallel with that in his own Fürchte dich nicht. But motet as a genre as well wasn't necessarily such a big deal anymore so could you kind of drill down into that yes yeah, so there was this long tradition of motets in 17th century central german lands and they were these these pieces where you combined as you were describing in johann christoph's uh you combined biblical texts and sometimes chorales so there was already this um, technique of a kind of mosaic of different texts being juxtaposed. And particularly, they were associated with funerals. So all those texts that we were talking about in the Dichnik are texts that would be used to comfort and console the bereaved or to prepare for the death. So, you know, do not fear what's going to happen. And then, you know, truly, truly, I will be with you in paradise. And then maybe a Quran also singing words of reassurance. So they're kind of like this dire of voices um, already kind of, of familiar texts that would be used in devotion and would really design to kind of help help people. Um, so there was already that tradition in, in the UCM and Motets of Johann Christoph Bach. Uh, but J.S. Bach then just takes that to a much uh, more extreme level, this combination of different textual sources. Um, so, for instance, in Jesu Maya Freude, several verses of the chorale, plus all these texts from the Bible, and alternating in this huge kind of symmetrical pattern. Um, or in the 
in even in motets like um Sint den Herrn, um taking the eight voice texture which was used used by Johann Christoph Bach but using it in a in a much more extreme and extended way uh, particularly in the phrase lengths um and and yeah, so so the Ikhlasa Dichnicht is is really interesting in this because for a long time people thought it wasn't actually by J.S. Buck because it seemed too simple, um, and it was in this collection of motets, the Altbuckishes Archiv, which people thought of as the ancestors' motets. Um, but now the scholarly consensus has moved to it being. Um, uh, an early, a relatively early work by J.S. Bach, um, closer to those of his predecessors in having less uh, complex overlapping of texts and not quite as extended uh, musical length, but harmonically still slightly more adventurous in some of the chords um, it uses. Uh, but for J.S. Bach, actually, because all this was... Um, these motets from his his family archive, these were so much you know, part of the family and they had layers of additions, like extra performance parts put on by later members of the family. Sometimes they didn't actually bother writing on who was the original composer in the first place. So I think that's the case of it, Lassa Dichnix. There's no manuscript that has a clear indication of the composer. But they all knew because it was, fam it was like the family heirloom and, and after a while, it just became maybe common property between them because they would be reusing it and adding adding to it and adding these layers like kind of artwork in which you've added you know a, a, a new layer of painting on the top um, that's what the manuscripts are like they just have all these chronological layers in it <laughs> It certainly uh, would have been useful for us if uh, Bach had written on the score of the manuscript perhaps what event each of these pieces was for, because it's only in the case of Der Geisthilf that we know um, that it was for a, a particular funeral. But there is this very interesting new theory about Zingit dem Herrn um, from Meinolf Bruser, where he um, postulates that, although in my mind Zingit dem Herrn, how could one have a more joyous piece? How could that possibly be for a funeral? But uh, um, his theory is that um, in 1726, um, well, it's, it is the case that in 1726, uh, one of the choristers in the Thomas Schule passed away, actually died inside the Thomas Schule, and um, would have been in fact the chorister, the very first chorister to matriculate under Bach's tenure, or at least the first new chorister, so perhaps one that he had taken care to select. Um, <clears throat> and when one looks more closely at the middle uh, section with the chorale in it, there's a lot, actually a lot of reference to youth um, and, um, you know, the father looking after his children and so on. And, and the theory is then also when Bach writes this slightly mysterious instruction to repeat the entire middle section with the two choirs swapped around, which nowadays to us is perhaps a little bit difficult to justify uh, considering how long uh, the piece is already apart from anything else um, the theory is then that you know each every one of the choir then in the Thomas uh, in the in, in the Thomana Chor would have sung the words Gott nimm dich ferner unser an you know sort of keep looking after us please God um, and this would have been actually a very personal uh, piece for them um, also with with other um, musical uh, references um, in the piece. Um, and uh, sticking with Zing at Dame Herrn, I wonder if we could close with um, thinking about how these pieces sort of lived on and, and Bach's legacy in that sense, because the motets are 
unique, I think, in that they're more or less the only works by Bach which, you know, weren't um, used as as toilet as toilet paper after he died. Sorry, as um, uh, fire firewood or fire fodder. Um, <clears throat> immediately after his death, or at least weren't locked up in a drawer and forgotten about because they were old and not gallant enough, or whatever it might have been. Um, and, you know, certainly the Tomanico, and specifically in the case of Zingit, you know, was really a, a, a showpiece for them and stayed in the repertoire. So really the only piece is to probably to continuously remain in the repertoire and remain performed um, from the moment of Bach's death onwards and of course there's this famous encounter uh with mozart uh in 1789 where he he heard the tomanico sing sing at dem Herrn and it blew his mind um you know we are performing these motets all in a big bunch together in concert um sometimes in church sometimes not but obviously we're we're um we're turning their context upside down i wonder bettina whether um uh, by the way, I loved the verb you used earlier, which I'd never heard before, envoicing. I think um, <laughs> I'm going to use that more, possibly in conjunction with invoicing. Um, but uh, what's your, yeah, what's your take on, 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 you know, how we hear these pieces nowadays? They've got, a, they're in a nice group of six. You know, we can, we can put them on a pedestal. What's changed? Well, I mean, as Stephen was alluding to, they're obviously not in a nice group of six because uh, there might have been other ones and, and maybe not that one and so on and so on. So um, I'm, I'm afraid I have to put a spanner in the works in, uh, you know, of your beautiful fantasy of, of these pieces as timeless um, works of genius. Sure. Um, they are works of genius. I mean, I, you know, I would subscribe to that. But, and they are timeless, surely. Uh, well, I think you're right that when they were when they were heard in the early 18th century, they were serving a very different purpose from uh, what we might want to get out of them now in terms of sitting in a concert hall and, and hearing them. Although I would say that um, some of the things we have been talking about in terms of what this music can do to you as a listener, um, that that sense of uh, spiritual uplift, that idea of the recreation of the spirit that, that Bach was going on about, um, those those kinds of things uh, sort of survive the transposition from the sacred to the secular sphere. And um, I think what we've talked about, uh, what, what Stephen, what you were outlining about Bach sort of pushing things to the extreme um, in terms of how he relates to the tradition of the 17th century motet and so on. I, 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 I feel with so much of his music, there is a sort of, I don't know, I've never, never thought about this, but there is a sort of theology of excess at work, right? It's just overflow. It's just um, pushing things beyond really what would have been reasonable in the context of a Lutheran church service. You know, that idea of uh, music as as part of the adiaphora of, of the sort of um, unnecessary but allowable add-ons to the liturgy, right? That, that music really just uh, pushes beyond those boundaries. And in that sense, it pushes into a realm where the kind of idea of music for its own sake uh, becomes much more plausible, right? And so in that sense, Bach's music then shifts over into a kind of idea of the aesthetic that we then, you know, um, uh, perform in the concert hall. To quote Jacob Collier, one's buffer becomes full. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps I'll leave the last word with Bach. There's a fantastic uh, sort of counter subject in uh, the beginning of Der Geisthilft, where he, you know, he really envoices embodies this uh this sense of spiritual up uplift which you're talking about bettino and uh, <clears throat> the soprano is first thing der geist hilft unser schwachheit auf <laughs> Rip, sort of grabbing us by the collar and pulling us up an octave and uh turning our our hopelessness into something you know that that octave leap which just shoots us up uh, towards towards the stars as it were uh, something that one can only experience in performance um, 
thank you so much all three of you for your time this morning and the fascinating discussion which has gone in all sorts of di different directions both uh, historical and theoretical and practical that is what we like um hoping to see all of you again some point in the cafe house and hopefully also at one of our performances uh of these pieces in in England and or in Germany in summer and this winter and if not we are recording them all in the Bachkirche in Arnstadt in June um, I noticed on the front of your Rethinking Bach book Bettina you've got that wonderfully louche statue of the young uh, JSB you know probably out on the town in in Arnstadt uh, as he was in his early 20s or late teens yeah I don't know why they decided to quite center the crotch so much. I mean, you know, I, I wanted it to be uh, a rethinking of how we think about Bach, but yeah, the, the way that it's covered on the cover, it, it does sort of, yeah. That statue, that statue <laughs> is just like that. I'm putting, yeah, no, put, no, you're right, you're right. Putting the crotch back into the crotchets. <laughs> In, indeed. Um, yeah, great. Thanks so much, everybody, and uh, take care. All the best. Bye. Right. See you rehearsal. Thanks for listening and well done for making it to the end of this episode of the S Cafe House. As ever, if you enjoyed it, please rate the podcast or share it with your friends. And if you want to find out more about what Solomon's Knot does, then you can sign up for our newsletter on our website or follow us on any of the usual social media. Thanks. Did you just say putting the crotch back into the crotchets? Yes. Yes. That's, I mean, that, that just takes the biscuit. <laughs> Put it, you can use that as the tagline for your book. Yeah. If you like. yeah. No, fam, you, you, don't I love need it. To, you don't need to quote me. It's okay. <laughs> See you Thanks. soon. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.